I couldn't stop myself crying out. What with the municipal band playing so stirringly and our lads charging forward and then some of them falling in the smoke. Oh no, he's dead. I thought I might faint. Seeing those poor wounded soldiers has given me an idea. I've decided to give up piano teaching for now and become an auxiliary nurse at the new hospital in Coal Hill. I can do this. Extraordinary! The new moving picture we saw last night. I took my John and some of the staff to the Wimborne screening. The Battle of the Somme. Great guns destroying the German defences. We cheered our brave boys leaping over the trenches through barbed wire and disappearing through the smoke. It was as though we were actually there. Eighth of June, 1916. It was seeing that demonstration in London that convinced me to volunteer at Bowcroft Hospital. Thousands of women marching with their banners, confident and self-assured. I cancelled all my concert engagements and persuaded Florence, my sister, to travel with me to Dorset. And here we are, in Coal Hill, ready for the challenge. We women will show those men. We too can serve. What shall I tell her, Sydney? He's still so young. Wouldn't understand. Have to know sometime. Wish I could cry. I'm sure Mum thinks there's something wrong with me. Nothing left of you. Nothing. Those wicked Huns! I want to do something. Work, but not back in service. War work. I want to make you proud, Ted. For a nipper's sake. Knit, 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 for the nights will soon be cold. Knit, 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 I finished six mufflers and ten socks. And we've learnt first aid at guides. I can work at the new hospital. But Mother says, You're too young. We need things doing here in the shop. But I'd rather be outdoors, helping with the war against the horrid Hun. I'd really, really like to be a soldier. Except they don't let girls be soldiers or sail ships, which isn't fair because I am strong. Yesterday, I was at the municipal school again, watching the children doing their bit for the war effort. Click clacking away as they sang in unison. Such a lovely sound. I shall miss it, of course. 
giving piano lessons, particularly to the children. Hilda the other day, little Hilda, she played me that lovely tune, the last piece we did together. She said, how long till we start lessons again? But there's no knowing. What do you say to a child? I told her one or two things about Bowcroft, what I do, but you can only say so much. Miss Coggin looks so smart in her uniform. She came into the shop and told me all the jobs she does. Helping doctors clean wounds, holding a soldier's hand when they feel frightened. I, I wanted to ask her other things like how, how soldiers with terrible wounds, how they live and what will happen to them after the war. Some government people are coming to Wimborne next week. There is a new factory at Halton Heath. Royal Navy. They're looking for women to work there, making cordite. So, it feels right, being as you were in the Navy. I don't really know what cordite is. I think it's for bombs on our ships. You'd know all about that, Ted. Someone said it's dangerous work. So what? I'm not scared. They pay twice as much as your ladyship. And I'll be doing it for you. And Sydney. It'll be like joining up myself. Twelfth of June, nineteen sixteen. Yesterday there was so much to do. We had a big intake and didn't know how many would be in bed and how many up in the common room. About 2.30 they arrived. We were watching the tents being set up in the garden. It was very hot. And when they arrived there was something almost thrilling seeing the men, very dirty, tattered, brown, all the way from Pozier and Delville Wood, to Coal Hill, to that garden. The bad cases went straight to bed, two boys gassed, one with his hand gone, and three eye cases, some shot in the chest. Later, we took two tea to them in bed, and as I was lifting one man to feed him, I could feel Mary and Florence looking from behind the door. Last week, Matron asked me to go down to Church House to help the Ladies' League with the bandage cuttings. Three times a week they meet. I was surprised how many people were there, even Lady Hannam. I went round the different groups. We did tails and limbs, triangles and hips, stumps, rollers, washing swabs and jug covers. There was a lovely feeling in the air, a buzz of chatter but not all talk. Some people just getting on with it, happy to be out there helping with other people, not alone. This morning, I was on the lawn watching John practicing sword fighting with Henry. John's determined to join up as soon as he's 17 next year. It doesn't seem a day since they were little boys running up and down the stairs playing with their tin soldiers. Their father would be proud. And Maud. She enjoyed battles every bit as much as her brothers. And now she's joined the Minster Bell Ringers. 
and is very proficient at learning the ropes. On Christmas Eve, she'll be up in the tower, ringing in the birth of our dear Lord, and the Reverend Fletcher will prepare his words, and we'll all say a prayer for our brave boys. I've done it, Ted. I've survived my first day at the Cordite factory. When we arrived, we had to go through gates with barbed wire, past guards with guns, like going to a prison. They gave us these caps and white waterproof dresses and hideous rubber clogs we had to put over our shoes. Esme made a fuss. You remember her from the big house? We got told off. If you were taking any grit on your shoes, you could spark some cordite and blow everyone up to kingdom come. I felt so embarrassed. After we got dressed up, we ended up carrying these heavy sacks of white stuff, like flour, and pouring it into a great drum. And these metal hands mixed it together to a brown paste. We oh, looked good enough to eat, like the honey cakes Cook used to make. You love them. So, I felt quite at home. Till some bossy cow says, don't you eat that paste, or you'll end up sick as the last idiot you tried. I miss you, Ted. Twenty fourth of June, nineteen sixteen. Never will be forgotten. Our musical times at Bowcroft. Because music has a way to bring people out of themselves. Bagnum was at the piano in his wheelchair singing the dear little shamrock very tenderly. There's a dear little plant that grows in our And the choruses, all our voices together, sent tricklings down the spine. We singing to them, and they to us. With home sweet home, the men formed a lovely bass undertone. Very impressive. Wyke sang Sweet Adeline in a beautiful high tenor. The next day he left. He said goodbye and he gave me his photograph. Even German folk songs I sang, which they loved. What this war means, what it stands for, is in music. Already I've been at Bowcroft six months. Scores of men have come and gone in that time. And sometimes when they're leaving to go back to the front or home, after so much closeness then suddenly gone, I suppose I feel a sort of loss. Then I remembered one of those albums for autographs and little messages that I was given last year. Dark brown leather with gold lettering across the front. So from then on, I ask some of the men to write little messages before they leave. Some do drawings really well. One even wrote a few bars of music. Ronald Goma, a tall, distinguished man. He wrote out the music of For a While and underneath some lines by Shelley. Music. When soft voices die lingers in the memory. Absolutely what I think. Do you know what this is? An axe head. Bronze Age Tom thinks. He gave it to me for my collection of curiosities before he joined up. I went with mother and father to watch him march away through the corn market. I waved and waved, 
but inside I felt sad. Tom? Tom's worked in this shop for as long as I can remember. It's not the same without him. Like a brother he was. Is. One time he let me sit in the wheelbarrow and he wheeled me all around the yard and we laughed and laughed. And now he's gone. Foreman's been on again about getting production levels up if we're going to win the war. On the train home, Mary, one of the older women, was saying it's wrong making us work so hard. An accident waiting to happen. They must know what they're doing. Look at me hair. Going green. From the chemicals. Some of the girls' skin's gone yellow. Like canaries. I'm not grumbling. We'll get through this. Sydney's learned to walk. Showed me a photograph again the other day. Mum thinks it's not a good idea. But I want him to remember you, Ted. He loves that boat you gave him. Plays with it in the bath. Says, Daddy, boat. Eighteenth of July, nineteen sixteen. This morning we went for a walk with Matron and eight of the lads. Quite a troop. <laughs> Their feet in service boots made such a noise we could hardly hear ourselves talk. All the way to Canford we went. Bagnall began to get tired, so we sat by the river enjoying the quiet. None of us said much unless we saw a butterfly or a fish. Just listened to the summery sounds. Robinson persuaded us to go back a new way, which turned out to be a very immense way, all through Wimborne, which was part of the plan to buy lemonade. <laughs> then they gallantly offered us drinks all round, cavorting along the pavement with bottles in their hand. Poor Bagnall was dead beat, and it was quite a business to get the poor boy home all the way up Rowlands Hill. This morning in town, I bumped into Bessie Angel in the high street. She was walking towards me, slowly, head down. And I could have crossed over, but in a way I wanted a chance to face her. I didn't know what I would say and suddenly there we were. I found myself saying, I'm so very sorry Mrs Angel about, but before I could finish, she told me she'd just been to the post office to send a letter to the war office, asking them to send her son's things back. Because she said it would help them forget the quicker. A strange thing. I was helping in the shop when there was a loud rat-a-tat-tat and Amelia Angel's face appeared at the window so white it made me shiver. Her mother was paying for some beans and Amelia came rushing in crying, Mother, Mother, come quickly, Mother. Mrs Angel's face turned to stone. She didn't say a word. She dropped the beans, put her arm around Amelia and they both rushed out. I heard Mother whisper, The second one she's lost. Second of September, nineteen sixteen. Some people talk more than others. Some never say anything at all. 
Sometimes a story comes out of the blue, like Sergeant Bowren's. He's been out on the front since the beginning, through the Mons retreat. He tells stories in a gentle, modest way. One afternoon, he said, his brigade reached a bridge on the outskirts of a French town. Everything was still and quiet, until suddenly out ran a young girl waving her arms. Alamand, she screamed. Alamand! Warning them that the town was full of Germans hidden in the houses, with the residents kept quiet. A shot rang out, and the brave girl fell dead. But Boren's brigade got away safely, and on they went. Now he is here, telling his story. I was just coming out of the house, and there he was, a tall young man in a blue uniform, running across the lawn towards me, singing wildly, pack up your troubles. And as he approached us, that the children had just come out of the house, he stopped and stood, his eyes fixed on something behind us. And then he fell to his knees and started pouring out a torrent of words about a fellow soldier, a corporal or a sergeant, being blown up by a shell in the midst of battle. Desperate, troubled words, as if he were there in the battle. I took the children inside at once. But Maud was very brave. She stayed and talked kindly to the young man. We called the Red Cross Hospital and they came and got him. There were no visible wounds. Six months have been a whole knee, Ted. And it isn't getting any easier. The shifts are longer now. And I'm not home till late. Mum never grumbles. But I don't see so much of her as Sydney. And there was an incident today at work, on her tea break. Mary said, it's wrong, us making these weapons to kill young men just the same as ours, apart from being German. I had a real go at her. For not being patriotic, called her a filthy traitor. Wish I hadn't. Harry's always been so good to me. Ted, when will this war end? Twenty first of October, nineteen sixteen. Heard that my darling Edmund died last Sunday. Just bowed down with grief. His mother writes that he was taken down to the casualty station, dangerously wounded, and died some time late. Last night, I had a dream about Tom. I was playing a piece of music, one that Tom liked, and suddenly there was a big bang like an explosion and the door flew off its hinges and a great wind blew. So I ran in and there, on the mat, was a telegram the size of a big white bedspread with the words Tom Stone written in big red letters 
and I could see it was b blood. Seventh of November, nineteen sixteen. It's the small things I want to remember. The atmosphere in a room on a sunny day. And Corporal Lewis and Sergeant Bowen, DCM. Such a pair of dears. Quietly reading their nice books and enjoying a cup of tea. And in that room a beautiful spirit prevails. Where those two fine men lay. They wrote in my diary that they would remember the musical times, the lovely walks and interesting talks. Trust, Bowron wrote, you will be spared forever. So cheer others as you have myself.